Hi guys, welcome back to Mysteries Channel. Thank you for clicking on my video, I really do appreciate it. Today we're talking about red ochre and cave life. Red ochre and cave life, you heard me. Now I go on and on and on about how myth and legend, they tie us together from around the world. Though we have separate languages and we are vastly dispersed and for long periods of time, continents were separated from each other where we didn't even know that they existed. But yet somehow these different places throughout all this time tell very similar stories. For generation upon generation, or as far back as we know, it's important. There is a reason for all of this. It's a story so important that it had to be told. A story that even Earth herself tries to erase, but we just keep holding on to it, telling it over and over again. Because these stories make you remember that you have to look up, you have to see what's coming. They tell us of history and of morals. What was the origin of these stories? Can we ever find out? Maybe if we look at things with fresh eyes and not try to funnel in our preconceived notion of the way the past was, we can better understand what exactly happened or was happening back then. These ties that bind us, these legends that let us know that at one point in time, we had to have known of each other, right? And I know you're thinking, you were talking about geomagnetic excursions in the last video and today you're talking about freaking red ochre and cave life, like what gives? I'm just saying, I think it's all connected. So let's get into it. Ochre, red ochre especially, but other ochre colors as well have long held traditions. No matter where you live on this planet, ochre was important to you in your ancient, ancient, ancient past. Ochre has cultural traditions that ties us to our ancestors and their ancestors and their ancestors' ancestors. This stuff was important. The history and the significance of red ochre goes back at least 300,000 years of that we know of. Yeah, what is it? Ochre is a family of earth pigments which include yellow ochre, red ochre, purple ochre, sienna, and umber. All of the ochre colors feature the ingredient of limonite. And basically, limonite is an iron ore consisting of the mixture of hydrated iron oxide hydroxides. If you're wondering what that is, I'm just going to tell you now. It's sunblock, people. Ochre occurs naturally in rocks and soil, especially in any environment where iron minerals have pooled and formed. It can be found in valley edges, eroded off cliffs, and in caves eroding out of the bedrock. That being said, it's pretty easily found and obtained. Red ochre, the use of this mineral, it has been questioned by all for a very long time. What we do know is that since prehistory, there are two meaningful regularities that show up in human evolution. That is tool making and the use and the collection and mining of ochre. Interesting, isn't it? Red ochre, especially out of all the ochres, red ochre especially. Most anthropologists believed in the past that ochre was used for mortuary customs throughout humanity, but in reality, we now know that it played a significant and important cultural role in a lot of things. It wasn't just for the dead, the living used it a lot as well. It was kind of like this magic all-in-one substance. I don't know if you guys are old enough to remember this stuff, but if you're an American and you had a mom that was alive in the 90s, it is very likely that your mom bought this stuff called Skin So Soft. It had a very distinct smell and it had like 101 uses. You would use it as a lotion, you would use it as a bug repellent, you would use it as a perfume. It was a bath oil. It took markers off the walls. It took stickies off your skin from band-aids. It was something that just was used for everything. And I think ochre was that for ancient humans. It could have looked like this. Use this product to decorate your new cave that you're living in because the sun's rays are frying you alive. But wait, there's more. You're out of water and you have no choice but to go and get it during daylight. Rub red ochre on your body and your hair and give yourself a few more seconds before you fry. Aunt beat it and make it back from the watering hole. Worry not, fellow human. Wait for darkness, gather her body, liberally cover it with red ochre before cremation. Why? Because you loved her. She was special and she deserves it. There are clouds overhead and the hunters, they want to go out and hunt, bring back some meat if they can even find it at this point. But they are worried. What if the clouds part? Then what? Well, cover them in red ochre so that if the clouds part, they have a few more moments to find shelter, to give themselves a chance. You know what I mean? And not only that, but this ochre, not only does it protect them from the sun, but it might even hold in their stench a little bit so the other animals don't smell them coming. But wait, there's more. Do you have figurines or idols of significance? Cover them with this red ochre. The gods bless you when you have it on. You have a little bit longer to live. Give it to these special items as well. Now, I know that I kind of sound ridiculous right here, but I'm telling you, that is really what it was like back then. We've talked about it before in the Homo erectus video when we look at the Venus statues. 
Many, if not most of them, are covered in red ochre. There are many things covered in red ochre that show that there was some kind of spiritual or symbolic, but I'm leaning more towards spiritual value to them. The Venus figurines are just one of them. Musical instruments that are also liberally covered with this stuff. They put it on a lot of things. I truly believe that the ancient people looked at it like it was a gift from the gods. So let's look at some stuff that kind of ties together red ochre, caves, and possibly, and I know it's a stretch, and this is wild speculation on my behalf, but possibly geomagnetic excursions. We're going to start with Blombos Cave in South Africa. Now look at this little piece of ochre right here. Looking at this piece of ochre, let's be honest, it's not that crazy impressive, right? Because I am not a trained professional, I would have walked past it and possibly not even really paid attention to it because I would not have realized that someone took the time to pit this out and carve all these lines across this piece of ochre. But that's exactly what happened there. Feast your eyes on this, people. This is the oldest work of modern art that we have found to date. And uh, yeah, now let's look at this one. Now this one does look much more like art. This was from the same cave, the exact same time period, and it's another piece of carved red ochre. And again, this is from around 100,000 years ago. And that's right, it kind of coincides with the Blake event. Now the Blake event was a geomagnetic excursion that had a severe eight out of 10 biosphere impact. Interestingly, the similar zigzag pattern markings were found in a shell from Indonesia. And that shell dated to 430,000 years ago. I had to know, was this time 430,000 years ago connected to a known geomagnetic excursion? And indeed it was. It's called the Brunei event. Exhibit two, look at this fun little piece here. This is not a carved piece. Instead, that is a piece of rock where an ancient human being took red ochre and mixed it with blood of an animal to make it into a crayon. And they drew that same interesting crisscrossy pattern onto this rock. This rock dates from 73,000 years ago, or at least the ochre that was painted on there dates to 73,000 years ago. Now, when you're looking at this ancient rock, do you think that it has abstract appeal? It was also found in Blombus Cave, in the southern shore of South Africa. And that's right, it also occurred during a geomagnetic excursion. And it was the big one, the one that almost wiped us out, the Toba event. The event that kills off almost all gorillas, chimps, monkeys, and us. This geomagnetic event was named Toba after the super volcano that erupts around this exact same time. And I wanted to note this because I didn't note it in either of the other two videos where I talk about Toba, but this eruption also dumps the most sulfuric acid that's ever been pumped into our atmosphere that we know of. It was just a very cataclysmic event on earth. And I really wanted to find a whole bunch of more art from this time period or something to connect it, but, but let's be honest, we're pretty darn lucky that someone during this crazy event where humanity is dying off in droves, took the time to make a crayon to make that interesting art that somehow mimics the art from 20,000 years earlier in that cave. And something else I just wanna say really quick, what if those aren't abstract? What if someone's trying to catalog something that they're seeing in the sky? And I've really gone back and forth whether I should do this because this video is really just my own pure speculation, but it's something interesting to think about. When you look at humanity, there seems to be these eruptions of symbolism in ancient man. And in fact, there's something telling about early African and Middle Eastern eruptions of symbolism. They come and then they go. The beads, the paint, the etchings on ochre, the ostrich eggs. In each case, these artifacts show up in the archaeological record, persist for a limited amount of a few thousand years, and then disappear again. Then they vanish. The same applies to technological innovation. Honestly, bone harpoon points found nowhere else before 45,000 years ago have been uncovered in the Democratic Republic of Congo in sediment layers twice that old. And another interesting thing to think about is that these weird explosions of symbolism seem to coincide with geomagnetic excursions. Is it because people have to think, really think about how to survive these things? They have to live in caves. They have to be very specific about what time they leave the cave, if they're fully prepared to leave the cave. You know what I mean? It's very much harder to hunt food since it's also all dying out, likely. I mean, we have a lot of record of mass extinction events happening while these geomagnetic excursions are happening. Now, you guys already know I suck at pronunciation, so I think this is called the Deep Kloof Rock Shelter. I'm gonna quote the Wikipedia article on it. Deep Kloof 
Rock Shelter is a rock shelter in Western Cape, South Africa, in which has been found some of the earliest evidence of human use of symbolism in the form of patterns engraved upon ostrich eggshell water containers. These date to about 60,000 years. The symbolic patterns consist of lines crossed at right angles or oblique angles. It has been suggested that by the repetition of this motif, early humans were trying to communicate something. Perhaps they were trying to express the identity of a group or of an individual. It's interesting how this same pattern just keeps showing up over thousands of years. I mean, there's a long jump between each one of these from the earliest time period till now, we're now at 40,000 year gap. Also, I'm gonna add to this exhibit because this is really tied to the Vostok event that this is Magjed baby. And this is the earliest rock shelter found to date in Australia. And it is covered, covered with petroglyphs. But look at that. One, it's completely exposed. You can see that there's a lot of water erosion in the area. And we're lucky even just to have this little tiny little piece of it down here. All right, let's go on to the Lachamp event and Gorham's Cave. Okay, discovered in 1907, Gorham's Cave is a natural sea cave located on the southeastern face of the Rock of Gibraltar. And it is the last known place of Neanderthal occupation that we have today. This, my friends, is where we became alone in the world. This planet, who at one point in time hosted a dozen hominids walking upright at once, is down to the very last of this kind, us. And as I mentioned in the last video, it looked like the ending to the Neanderthals was not a pleasant one. There are a lot of signs of cannibal at the end there. But look at this. This is what's found in that cave. The scratches consist of eight lines arranged in two groups along three long lines and intersected by two shorter ones. It is suggested that this is a symbol. The scratches are thought to be at least 39,000 years old because of a sediment layer that was on top of it, but it was likely older than that. And because this is a known Neanderthal hangout, hideout, this is where they die off. Some anthropologists suggest that Another human came in after they were all dead and scratched that in there. Or this is something completely modern that somehow the cave shifted a little bit and made it seem like there was a sediment layer. Very unlikely. What we do know is that this simpler art is at least 39,000 years old. And we also know that this cave has been inhabited since about 47,000 years ago. Interestingly, that seems to line up completely with the Lachamp excursion. And now over to Africa, during the same excursion, Lachamp, there is also the oldest mine on earth. Interestingly, what do you think was mined there? That's right, you guessed it, red ochre. Sunblock was in high demand, people. I'm not even joking. Like, I know it seems like I'm being ridiculous, but I really think that's what this was. It was a gift from God. It could save your life if you put it on your skin. Okay, let's go to the Lake Mungo excursion. This is kind of out of order, but I wanted to show you this rock cave here. This rock cave is called Nawarla Gabarnmung. And although I'm showing you for the Lake Mungo excursion, which happened about 22,000 years ago, this cave was carved out by Aboriginal people during the Lachamp excursion. They carved this out. What's interesting about it is it reminds me of the Native American petroglyphs. When you have a place that is holy or important, location, 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 it seems like this place stays prominent and important in their culture for a very long time, obviously at least 20,000 years. And in those 20,000 years, they are decorating and redecorating the inside of it. Looking at these pictures, you can see the red and white and black charcoal outlines all over the entirety of this cave. And some of the pictures look like this. Now this one here, that is pretty obviously a woman. You see a woman, maybe there's a headdress on her, definitely see her breasts. And I think it's very interesting to look at her legs. Doesn't that pattern look familiar? Although the cave is from 44,000 years ago, it is believed that these drawings on top the ones that we see here. Because when you look at this drawing, you see all this red stuff in the background? Those are earlier drawings. She's drawn on top of probably many layers of earlier, earlier, earlier drawings. It's so freaking interesting. And then here, oh look, there's the guy. Again, I'm pretty positive he's got a headdress on, but look that crisscross pattern that shows up in a lot of different art that is taking place during excursions. I don't know, is it connected? Am I just making random connections? Possibly, but I do think it's an interesting coincidence. All right, and then we're gonna skip over to the Gothenburg excursion. We talked about this before. A lot of people still believe that the Americas wasn't really populated until maybe the melting of the ice bridge between the two continents in that they've been here for 10,000 years. But if that's the case, 
they immediately marched their little butts down to Mexico and started mining red ochre. That's right, you guys, red ochre, and it's a huge mine. It's very interesting. Here's a picture of the underwater mine because that is how much things have changed since back then. Gothenburg excursion lines up with the Younger Dryas period. As we said before, this is a period of mass extinction across the Americas. I was reading in one of the papers that they believe that anything that weighed more than 1,300 pounds went extinct. And around the same time period, what else do we find but another mine? And this mine is called the Lovas Mine in Hungary. It mined red ochre specifically. They date this to around 13,000 years. And the last thing I want to bring up, obviously different places are affected differently by these excursions. But I do find it extremely interesting that many origin stories speak of coming out of caves or coming out from underground or coming out of the darkness. Is that because we were taking shelter in these caves just trying to survive what the heck is going on out there? Likely. I looked and I looked and I looked and I thought maybe there's another thing that comes up a lot in these ancient early tales. We think of it as one thing, but maybe the ancients were describing something that they're seeing in the sky, specifically the night sky, because we forget that during geomagnetic storms, what do we see? We see the northern and the southern lights, right? The aurora borealis, and I can't remember what the southern one is called, but it has a very distinct look. It's like a colorful snake in the sky. You know what I mean? A rainbow snake, rainbow serpent. Does this ring a bell? Aboriginals, North and South America speak of a colorful or rainbow snake or serpent in their ancient records, as well as the Japanese, Europeans, they're African legends. I'll try to do a whole nother video of just maybe these stories that might be tying to this ancient event that happened. But I did find one that I wanna share on this video specifically. This is a legend that's out of New Zealand. Here we go. Maui and his brother set out to the east to find the sun's resting place. They covered the entry to the sun's cave with nets and smeared themselves with clay to protect against the sun's heat. When the sun emerged, it fought and it struggled in the nets but the brothers, they held firm. Maui began to beat the sun. Some stories say he had an ax, others a club made of the jawbone of an ancestor, until the sun was so weak that it could no longer race across the sky. According to legend, that is why the sun travels so slow in the sky today. All right, guys, that's the story I have, but they do talk about putting clay on their bodies to protect against the sun's heat. Just saying or maybe radiation. Anyway, thanks you guys for watching. I'd really do appreciate it. You guys have yourselves a very great day.